Hi everyone and welcome to today's event. Um, my name's Kathy Errington. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of the Helen Clark Foundation. Uh, thank you all so much for coming out today. It's awesome to have such a good turnout. Uh, and welcome to everyone who's watching via live stream as well. We're really excited to be launching our latest report from the Helen Clark Foundation. Uh, it's called The Case for Yes on the 2020 Cannabis Referendum, and there, there are copies on the tables, but if those run out, uh, which I think they will do given the great turnout today, um, please have a look at our website because it's available there along with all our previous reports. We're holding this event today because New Zealand will face a crucial decision in 2020 about if we want to change the way we regulate personal cannabis use. A referendum is going to be held alongside the general election. And if we vote no, uh, we might lose the chance for change for a generation. We hope the discussion today can help make the case in favour of reform uh, for those of you who may still be on the fence for how you're going to vote on this often difficult and emotionally charged issue. Before I introduce our two distinguished speakers, who are likely already very familiar to you and won't really need much introduction, I'd like to take a moment to introduce the Helen Clark Foundation because you might not be familiar with us. We're a new think tank, we're based here at AUT. We launched in March this year, and we've actually already issued three reports. So please have a look at our website. We've published on getting to carbon zero, on social media regulation, and then our latest one, which is there on the tables today for you to take a look at on the case for yes in 2020. Uh, our goal as a think tank is to just make New Zealand a better place to live. We do that by researching the problems facing us and proposing solutions to them. If you'd like to support our work, please consider becoming a member. Uh, you can join on our website. Uh, your support allows us to hold events like this, which we work really hard to ensure are free and accessible to the public. And being a member gets you first chance to register, which, as you saw from today's event, our events do fill up really fast. So the format today is straightforward. I'll start off by asking our speakers some questions, and then there'll be a chance for audience members to ask your questions at the end. Uh, my colleague Paul will come round with a microphone. You probably met him at the door, but uh, Paul, could you just... Oh, he's actually still outside, so he'll come in and he'll come round with a microphone uh, when the time comes. Uh, I'd just ask, we don't have heaps of time, so if you do ask a question, please keep it focused, and only questions, not comments. So I think that covers off the practicalities. Oh, this, sorry to embarrass you, Paul, but um, this is Paul. He'll come around with the microphone later um, if, when, when the time comes. So please have a think about what questions you might like to ask. So I'll just turn now to the substance and introduce our two speakers. Uh, the Right Honourable Helen Clark was Prime Minister of New Zealand from 1999 until 2008, and she was Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme from 2009 until 2017. She continues to be highly engaged in issues across the sustainable development spectrum, from gender equality and women's leadership to climate action, health and drug policy, open government and peace. Mm -hmm. Helen Clark is also a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, which is particularly relevant to today's mm -hmm. conversation. Chloe Swarbrick is a Member of Parliament for the New Zealand Green Party, the youngest MP in Aotearoa for over 40 years. She champions youth representation and is a Green Party spokesperson on education, <laughs> internal affairs, <laughs> local government, small business, arts, culture and heritage and sensible drug law reform. So that's quite an impressive list. Uh, but that's enough from me. Uh, you're probably tired of my voice by now. So I'd like to start with by asking the Right Honourable Helen Clark. You say that good drug policy is often counterintuitive. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, firstly, thanks, Cathy. Thanks, mm -hmm. Chloe, for being here. And thanks, AUT, for hosting us uh, as a foundation and also the event today. When I say it's counterintuitive, what I'm getting at is that there has been such a barrage of propaganda mm -hmm. against drugs that often people think, oh, why would they advocate that? Because it's somehow drilled into the psyche. This is bad. This is wrong. Mm. Now, a couple of years ago, when I first joined the uh, Global Commission on Drug Policy, we released a report. And it was called uh, the, the Global Misperception of Drug Problem. <laughs> because it's all about perceptions. It's for historical reasons that we end up with very dangerous drugs like tobacco and alcohol that are legal. And frankly far less dangerous drugs like cannabis, mm. which are not. And if you go to the report we're releasing today and go to the centre spread, this sets out uh, the weighted score of harm on 
Uh, drugs. And alcohol is the one that's way at the top there, way off the, the, the graph almost, in terms of the, the damage that it, it, it does to individual and society. Cannabis is, 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 is way down. Uh, so what I've been working to do this last two years on the Global Commission on Drug Policy is really to get some facts out there mm. uh, about the issues mm. and to say that just to ban things doesn't stop people using them. Mm -hmm. What it does mean is they use them in conditions where the supply is accessed through criminal networks mm -hmm. and they face very significant risks themselves mm -hmm. of prosecution. Now, come to cannabis in New Zealand. Actually, over about the past decade, prosecutions have dropped by about 60%. It's not because fewer people are using it. It's just that uh, finally the police have decided there's probably better things to do. But still, close to 4,000 New Zealanders are dragged through the courts every year mm -hmm. on cannabis. And only about a fifth of that is for what is called in the law dealing or trafficking. Mm -hmm. The others are people, personal possession uh, and, and use and, and growing. And I say let us face up to the reality that 80% of Kiwis will use this drug at some point in their lives. Do any of us want our kids, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews dragged through court and have all the complications that that then uh, poses for life if they get a conviction? You may not get entry to the United States of America, you may be barred from certain jobs, etc. Totally disproportionate consequences. Uh, so let's deal with the misperceptions. With cannabis, we're talking about a significantly less harmful drug mm -hmm. than those we tolerate uh, legally now. Mm -hmm. No one would suggest banning tobacco or alcohol. There was an attempt to ban alcohol during the First World War and the troops came home and said, no way, Jose. It, banning doesn't work. Get a regulated set of rules around it. Chloe, did you have anything to add to that? I, I wasn't being rude on my phone, although it may have seemed like I was. Um, but what I was actually Googling, because uh, of course I was, uh, is a quote from uh, a man called John Ehrlichman, who was an advisor to Ronald Reagan during the 1960s. And this is the guy who was actually responsible for the war on drugs. And this is a quote from him from 2016 when he was uh, being interviewed at a in, uh, about his time in implementing that war on drugs. And this is a literal quote. Uh, quote, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin and then criminalising both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. That is the history of the war on drugs. Um, the history of the war on drugs is inherently racist. <laughs> the history of the war on drugs is not recognising that we have drug use across all demographics in society. Uh, the war on drugs is a way to perpetuate the mythology uh, that poor people deserve to be poor and addicts deserve to be punished. It does not get to the heart of solving the issue. And as Helen said, particularly in a New Zealand context, prohibition simply hasn't worked. When you're talking about cannabis in particular, 11% of the population are using on an annual basis. That is the equivalent of around 400,000 New Zealanders. As Helen stated as well, we have from the Otago um, Longitudinal Study that 80% of New Zealanders will use by the time they're 21. What we have is a status quo which increases harm. You have unknown people consuming unknown substances in unknown places purchasing off of unknown people. Uh, and all of that is the worst possible situation that increases harm. So basically what we're looking at when we're talking about legally regulating cannabis is not liberalising it, it's not chucking gummy bears off the rooftops. Uh, it is actually about getting control of the situation. And again, I think that that is really highly correlated to the misconception about it. And I think Kathy summed it up quite well in a piece that came out this morning uh, when saying that people who are advocating for prohibition are arguing about whether these drugs should exist. That's the wrong starting point because they do. And we've tried to eradicate them from planet Earth for the past 40 years. And worse than not working, it's made the problem worse. So we have to start dealing in reality. So my next question, uh, if, uh, I'll direct firstly to Chloe and then ask Helen for comment. But critics of legalisation claim that legalising will increase cannabis use and particularly among young people who are most at risk of cannabis related harm. So what do you think about that assertion? If you want to protect communities and you want to particularly protect young people, the best thing to do is to legally regulate cannabis. 
drug dealers do not check ID. And drug dealers are most interested, illegal drug dealers are most interested in making the most amount of profit. And what we currently have uh, is, you know, at either end of the spectrum, and this is actually, I nicked it from um, the drug policy, uh, what, are we, what are you guys called? Global commission. commission. Global Commission on Drug Policy. Uh, there's this amazing U-curve. I actually tried to explain it on Duncan Garner a few months ago. So, um, And basically it's about, there's this U-curve, right? And the peaks of harm are situations where substances are controlled either by the underground black market or by basically an unregulated free market. In both of those situations, you have uh, entities that are attempting to exploit vulnerable communities in order to make a quick buck. Where you have the minimization of harm, the bottom point of that curve, harm reduction, is through a sense of control and regulation. Basically, when you seek to legally regulate something, you create a supply chain that has opportunity for intervention and problematic usage, but also you implement a duty of care on those who are in sale and supply. Same with, for example, the sale and supply of alcohol. Uh, certain Those who sell alcohol can be charged and legally convicted if they are selling uh, or supplying to those who are underage. And this is a way that we can enforce that and reduce harm. What we saw, for example, under um, alcohol prohibition was, again, uh, that maximum increase in harm, which is that uh, prohibition side of things where it's controlled by the underground black market. I would argue that we're definitely more towards uh, the less regulated free market in alcohol and would advocate again for us to pull it back a bit. Uh, personally, I take a public health approach to all substances, uh, which means that we often end up with people really not quite understanding how we can advocate for reduction of advertising in alcohol, but also be arguing for the legal regulation of cannabis. And it's because you apply the same logic and principles to every substance, recognising that a substance in and of itself can be harmful but the response that we as legislators and policymakers create to that substance can either increase or minimise that harm. Right now, with this real hands-off approach and handing it to the gangs in the black market, we're increasing harm. So, um, Helen, what, what would you say to that? Just to reiterate the question, it's the, the contention that legalisation will increase cannabis use, oh, particularly so among the young. Um, yeah. What do you think uh, about that? Look, I, I really don't think it, it would have any significant impact. And it's interesting to look at the studies now coming out uh, from the US where it's been legalised for a number of years. Mm -hmm. If you take Washington State, the American Medical Association has published a study uh, showing that uh, usage actually dropped. <laughs> uh, Colorado has also had legalisation since 2012 mm -hmm. and use by teens there is absolutely flat. Mm -hmm. Look, it, it, think... Think yourself, the fact that something suddenly becomes legal, are you going to rush out and buy it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what it does mean is that those who are using it now, mm -hmm. we, we begin to address their issues. They're not criminalised by using a drug that, as I repeat saying, is significantly less harmful than tobacco mm -hmm. or alcohol. If you legalise and regulate, you get a grip on the market and you can also have upfront public health advocacy, right? Mm -hmm. At the moment, because it's prohibited, almost the message is, oh, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. No, look, there, of course there are issues around cannabis, mm -hmm. as there are issues around any substance. Mm -hmm. And people deserve to have the facts put out on the table in an environment where it's, where it's not threatening because they're not facing a risk of criminalisation mm -hmm. from use. I would say as well, I feel like um, uh, frequently the kind of approach that we have right now to drug education, particularly in schools, is very akin to where we were 40 years ago on sex education. You know, don't have sex because you will get pregnant and you will die. Um, uh, that's a terrible joke um, for those who haven't watched Mean Girls. But basically the abstinence-based uh, edu education, which uh, what we saw increase was um, sexually transmitted diseases and uh, pregnancy, teen pregnancy. Uh, when we introduced evidence-based education that recognises that this stuff happens and we need to take an approach grounded in reality to reduce harm, as we saw teen pregnancies decrease and sexually transmitted uh, diseases amongst young people decrease as well. Uh, and also when you provide that wraparound education around things like relationships and consent and all the rest, the situation only gets better. We have the opportunity to do something like that and meaningfully talk about the harm that something like cannabis can cause. But right now we have a Pandora's box where when we don't talk about it to our young people and we don't talk about the harm associated to it and we have this abstinence-based approach, Basically, the situation, This I'm saying this from an um, approach talking to a large number of young people in high schools, when they do try it and they realise that the sky doesn't fall in and their toes don't fall off, they go, what else have adults lied about? 
And we wonder why experimental behaviour only increases. We have to get real about this. Well, also, I'd say to any parent, mm. what's the least effective way of getting your kids not to do something? <laughs> It's to tell them not to do it, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like a dare. Mm, and that, mm, as Chloe mm. said, was historically the, the approach on, on sex, teen yeah. pregnancy and sex has been the approach on drugs. Young people try things. Mm. So, yeah, l let's try and make this as, as safe an environment yeah. as we can. Our report suggests, so this one, I'll oh, ask firstly to Helen and then ask Chloe for your thoughts. Our report suggests two models that New Zealand could potentially follow in regards to a legal cannabis market. One is a state monopoly based on what's been done in Uruguay, where cannabis is only purchased by the government and sold at pharmacies. The other is a regulated commercial market, which is what you see in Canada and some parts of the United States. Uh, so, Helen, what do you think is the best model for implementing a legal market for cannabis here in New Zealand? Well, those are the two ends of the spectrum. And at the Uruguay end, immediately people hear government stores. They say, oh, but we don't have those, do we? So that, that you know, I, I don't think you need to go that far. Um, on the other hand, I'm very conscious of not wanting to create another big tobacco or big alcohol in, a, in an unregulated market. So I'm all for, for regulation, which is very clear about the rules which should surround a sale. I'm personally not opposed to being, it being available over the, uh, the local counter. Uh, in Switzerland, as our global drug commission president stressed when she came out to visit uh, late last year, uh, you can buy cannabis in your local store. It is quite low, regulated low on THC, which is the upside of it, and uh, and high on CBD, which is the more calming side of it. But it's a, it's available locally. It, it's not an issue, and I, I think that you know most uh, people who observe these kinds of systems working like that don't see them creating much harm. I also would reflect on the fact that uh, the, the poor and marginalised who've been dying on our streets of this uh, horrible synthetic cannabinoid, if they'd have access in a local store to s cannabis which was legal and, and regulated as to content, would they be dying on the streets of Christchurch and other cities? No. Uh, so I, I think we find a Kiwi model that sits somewhere between Colorado and Uruguay. What do you think, Chloe? Yeah, I think um, what we actually saw when it came to synthetics, and I could give a, a long rant about this, um, particularly with the absolute uh, political diabolical mess that was the psychoactive substances legislation, the fact that we basically had ubiquity with the product being sold on dairy counters, then all of a sudden we created these regs, it meant that the problem became really visible because basically R18 wasn't allowed to be sold alongside um, liquor, so basically practically it was sold in adult shops, all of a sudden you had people lining up outside of it, there were knee jerk community reactions to it and instead of going these are people who maybe we need to help, we just said let's get rid of it. Yeah. And what we did uh, is, and Kevin Haig warned about this, unfortunately he was right, he said that there will be an increase in harm and we will see people die. It's exactly what happened. We had approximately 50 New Zealanders die every year until finally we took action this year. Uh, former Prime Minister said that this was an issue of personal responsibility, which I personally see as, a, as abdication of political responsibility and actually quite grotesque. Um, anyway, uh, on the point of... Um, cannabis uh, regulation and where I think New Zealand should sit on it. Uh, I think that, uh, speaking actually to those in Uruguay, uh, I was at uh, Vienna at the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs uh, earlier this year and we met um, in a bunch of different bilaterals including with Uruguay and with Canadians and all the rest. Uh, the thing about Uruguay's model is that they still have a problem with supply. Um, interestingly, Canada, being one of the first countries to move towards a medicinal cannabis legal regulated model, originally had state supply of cannabis. Um, what they found is that the state was really shocking at growing weed. Um, so they instead moved to a highly regulated commercial model for um, their medicinal cannabis product production. And I think that a similar thing, um, an opportunity rather, exists here in this country. Um, where I see the biggest opportunity and the biggest uh, ability to right past wrongs is to allow those communities who've been disproportionately targeted and harmed under cannabis prohibition uh, the opportunity to get that sense of restorative justice. 
Uh, so that for me is why Titiriti or Waitangi has to be central in our movement towards legal regulation of cannabis. Uh, and there's already some awesome moves that are starting um, around the likes of the East Coast with Hikarangi. Uh, but I'd also note that that's a key factor in your guys' report today uh, is, you know, we do not want the same situation that we've seen in many states in the US where the demographic who has been disproportionately targeted under the war on drugs is the absolute opposite of those who are currently profiting off of the legal regulated market. Mm. Um, and I think that this relates to a question you're going to ask me later, so I won't foreshadow that. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Um, but that was quite a shocking fact you pointed out. No one had died from synthetic cannabis before we made it illegal. Yeah, and now there absolutely. are dozens. Yeah. That's yeah. shocking. Yeah, but it's the same. It's really funny because we were looking at, um, you know, the, it was a really grotesquely politicised football, a hate parliament. And um, we were having this situation where the debate was absolutely, okay, and I went back to Hansard from 16 years ago, and it was the same debate that we were having around around uh, making P class A. The exact same debate, word for word, the arguments that were being used. And we saw harm increase when we increased criminal penalties. Because the flip side of the supply side of things is that when you criminalise those who are using or in possession of a substance, and often actually they tend to be the bottom of the pyramid in terms of the supply chain to fund their own habit, is that you push those people further into the shadows. They do not put their hand up and ask for help if they risk going away in handcuffs. So um, for Helen, uh, just turning to the international context, uh, how has your work with the Global Commission on Drug Policy influenced your views on drug policy here in New Zealand? Well, it, it's given me the, the time and scope to look a lot more deeply into the issues. I have never believed in criminalisation mm. of people who use drugs. If you go back 25 years, I gave a speech in Hamilton at a seminar, uh, which was looking then at issues around cannabis. And 25 years ago, I said that criminalisation was wrong and that we needed to move to a model which I called sort of part prohibition or part decriminalisation, mm. but keep people out of the courts and deal with this as a health and, and, and social issue. Uh, when I went to uh, UNDP, uh, I had a very good team of people who were working on uh, HIV and health issues. And of course, one of the uh, key um, uh, at-risk populations for HIV transmission was people who inject drugs. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at the issues again mm -hmm. uh, from, from that angle. And UNDP produced a good report for the UN uh, special session of the mm. General Assembly on drugs in 2016. And the Global Drug Commission used to come and, and visit me, and immediately mm. I left UNDP, they invited me to join. Uh, so th that, that's been a good opportunity also to get to know better a number of the Latin American uh, mm. presidents who have been dealing with the consequences of the war on drugs. You know, before... Uh, Mr. Calderon, as president of Mexico, uh, up the ante on, quote, the war on drugs in Mexico. Uh, uh, Mexico had quite a low homicide rate. Mm. It became a homicide capital of the world mm. when it moved in like that. And you have, you know, former Mexican presidents now, like Zedillo, who was mm. there when I began being PM, uh, who are just absolutely passionate on the need to legalise and regulate as a way of trying to get on top of the Mexican mm. uh, problems. Uh, when I called on former President Santos of Colombia in 2012, he said to me, Helen, my country's paid a terrible price for the war on drugs because, of course, the illegality had provided the income for the FARC and the other guerrilla groups as, uh, mm -hmm. as well, and they had cities which were wracked by, mm. by drug crime. Uh, so, yes, I, I have certainly learnt a lot. My thinking has evolved a lot over the years away from the, the part decriminalisation and prohibition to saying, let's just deal with this, let's legalise, let's regulate and let's deal with the health issues up front. Mm. Uh, it was really interesting. Russell mm. Brown um, this morning, he's an um, independent journalist, uh, tweeted about Helen Clark's speech in 1994 and about the lambasting that she received as a result of saying those kinds of things publicly. 1994 is the year I was born. We have been having these exact same debates for 25 years. Some people haven't moved. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. We won't call them out. But the other thing that I wanted to say is just uh, with regard to international um, examples, New Zealand used to be one. 
Mm. We were the first country in the world uh, to create a, a national needle exchange service mm. in the 1980s. The health minister at the time said that this was a nightmare and that this wasn't what he wanted to be doing necessarily, but it was the least worst thing that could possibly be done, which is to reduce harm and recognise reality. Um, talking about Ruth Dreyfus, who's the chair of the Global Commission, who Helen brought over for our cross-party group on drug harm reduction in Parliament last year, uh, you know, in the 1990s, Switzerland legalised heroin as a response to a spate of heroin deaths. Again, that wasn't about throwing things from the rooftops. That was about having a controlled environment safe rooms where people could be administered that drug by GPs. Uh, it was pure, so it wasn't adulterated by all of the things that it's cut with when it's nasty and controlled by gangs and all they care about is profit. And there are wraparound services available for the people who needed them. Because what we know is that the opposite of addiction, this is what Johan Hari says, the opposite of addiction isn't it's connection. And this is where we get so many things so fundamentally wrong. We're talking about all of this in the context of earlier this year, the government released the uh, inquiry into mental health and addiction. It's the first time that we didn't look at mental health through a pathologizing, medicalizing lens and recognize that social and environmental factors massively impact people's mental health. And we recognized and found therein that addiction is frequently the manifestation of underlying mental ill health, of isolation and of trauma. If you speak to people who have addiction or substance dependency or abuse problems, you will find that they frequently say that that substance is the only thing that is there for them when everything else is not. Mm. So that is about filling a hole. And instead of taking that thing away and punishing those people more, further causing isolation and trauma, surely we should be addressing the core root of the issue. I mean, you can take the compassion out of it if you want. You can take the evidence out of it if you want. It's the bloody economically sensible thing to do as well. Tax it. Jeez. Build roads national. <laughs> I feel like the example of Portugal warrants a mention while we're on international oh, yeah. cases. Oh, de mm -hmm. definitely, because they had the highest rate of drug-related deaths in Western Europe in the late 90s. And when the current UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, was Prime Minister, he said, we've got to get a grip on this, and mm. Parliament agreed with him, mm. bipartisan ever since, which is the way yes. it should be, by the way. This yes. isn't a left-right issue. It's an issue of you know, how, how you best advance health and well-being. Mm. Uh, so they, they moved to uh, decriminalise across the board and to go for massive harm reduction, mm -hmm. and they have been operating those safe spaces mm -hmm. that Chloe uh, referred to uh, really for uh, rather more than 20 years now. Now, mm. uh, I understand the uh, the drug-related death rate in the United States is around 50 times that of mm. Portugal, right? And now all, let's also acknowledge that there's some courageous U.S. states and cities which have been moving on harm reduction mm -hmm. because they're not prepared to see people die of drug overdoses uh, in, in their cities. The mm. federal government is the, the problem, yep. uh, but a lot of movement at the, at the local level. Mm. Uh, but uh, harm reduction, safe spaces, mm. being able to test your drugs at a music festival, these mm. kinds of things, we can save lives. You know, mm. We can get loss of life down to hopefully zero mm. if if we take an approach of what is in the interests of people's health and well-being. Yeah, and on the point of uh, Portugal, um, Jao Galo, who's often referred to as the, the architect of the Portugal approach, which has been operating for nigh on 20 years, as um, Helen mentioned, uh, I, he was also brought over um, to New Zealand and we had him at the cross-party group. And uh, really fascinatingly, uh, he said that whilst it's been really, really good, they've obviously seen, seen massive reduction in harms, He's saying that the next move is to look at legalisation of some drugs because they haven't managed to get rid of the, uh, the gangs. Mm. Gangs still control supply and people are still using drugs. Mm. Regardless of whatever approach you take, drugs are still going to exist. So why wouldn't we get control of supply in particular? Uh, on the point of the United States, uh, it's really fascinating because to me the opioid crisis is the perfect example of the other side of that harm where you have complete free market corporate control. Uh, and basically what you've seen there is that swinging between free market corporate control to black market illicit control. Uh, and again, there is no sense of harm regulation, uh, harm legislation that regulates um, that harm at the moment. Uh, and the other thing, which is a really interesting point to just mention on a factual basis around the evidence that's coming out of those states that have moved to legalise so far, is that they have seen massive reduction in opioids and they have seen massive reduction in alcohol harm as well. Mm. And just taking the Portugal point, point further, 
they went from being the highest number of yeah. drug-related deaths in Western Europe in the late 90s to the lowest today. It, what they're doing that mm. does work. Yeah. So my next question is for Chloe, and it's more on our domestic debate here in mm. New Zealand. But are you surprised that many MPs have preferred to remain silent in the debate so far? And why do you think that's happened? Oh, because politics. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, uh, New Zealand, um, just for some, some context, um, we have one of the most whipped parliaments in the Western world. So uh, I think that one of the many reasons for that is how we often see our parliament as like Lego blocks. Uh, or like Tetris, where you know you vote for a party and you presume that that whole party has exactly the same um, kind of homogenous view on something. But that's just not reality. And it's particularly, I think, the case that electorate MPs should be able to speak out against what um, their party is backing. But you just don't necessarily see it, um, particularly with two major parties. No, Doug, you can respond to that if you like. Um, uh, but... Yeah, where I think that uh, the big problem lies is in the perverse incentive structure inside our parliament. So if a politician is faced with the opportunity to do something transformative uh, or to keep their head down and shut up and to climb the ranks uh, and to keep their job, uh, then they're most likely to go for that option because it is very difficult to push the case for change when that case for change is complex and nuanced and requires substantive debate when you're operating in a soundbite media environment where everybody is competing for a little bit of oxygen. Uh, I know for a fact how difficult this is based on how many times I've been mischaracterised in the cannabis debate. Uh, you know, I'm frequently, uh, like, there's headlines about me being pro-cannabis or whatever. I'm not pro-anything. You know, if anything, I'm personally like a bit, ooh, I don't, I don't actually like cannabis very much. I've seen the harm that it can cause in my family and in the broader community. But what I think we need to do is get real about how we can reduce harm here. So I am not pro anything except for sensible regulation that reduces harm. And I think, um, as Helen said, the best way to actually just depoliticise this issue and move forward as a country is to work in those cross-party spaces, those cross-partisan spaces, and we've managed to do it somewhat with climate change, but things are starting to be wound back now, and I really worry about the lead-up to the 2020 election because all of this, um, to the other report that's been released by the Helen Clark Foundation, is happening um, primarily in a very noisy social media environment where fake news uh, spreads like wild wildfire. And, you know, the classic adage that it is easier to fool somebody than to convince them that they've been fooled. So I think that everybody um, needs to be taking a critical eye to anything that's said by any politician or any commentator, and of course that includes me. But, you know, I'm just really worried about how deeply partisan these things are getting and the fact that uh, the person who's saying it has become a proxy for the trustworthiness of that thing. And that's, um, to take it really far back, what worries me about the Trumpian type approach that we're seeing in international politics at the moment, where there's the discrediting of the mainstream media. The media plays a role to hold politicians to account and hopefully to fact check. If you take away trust in that mainstream media and you become the direct connection to the people who you're talking to, then that can pose a problem because you can be feeding them lies. So we all need to really be working on that critical thinking capacity, I think, as um, the political debate develops in this space. So my next question, uh, just starting with Helen, um, should those people who have a conviction for cannabis-related offences have that conviction wiped if the referendum passes and why? Well, that's what our uh, paper advocates. Mm. Uh, and again, I stress that having a drug conviction mm. on your personal record uh, can stop you getting entry to certain governments. It can bar you from certain jobs. So if we can go the way of, of legalisation, I believe those convictions should be expunged. I put in brackets that, you know, if it was a, a conviction where you also, you know, in the course of resisting the arrest or the police brought out a firearm or were violent. I mean, that, that's another matter. But just plain convictions for personal use, possession, mm. cultivation, supply, mm. I think should be expunged, and that's the position the paper takes. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, I find it 
worse than hypocritical, I find it absolutely abysmal that we have a majority of parliamentarians right now occupying the House of Representatives, many of whom have gone on the record saying that they have consumed cannabis in the past. Often, you know, when they're bridged at, in Parliament on the way to the House, they'll go, ha, 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 yes, in the midst of time back in my university days or whatever. Those people are now upholding law that penalises people for doing exactly the same thing that we all did. And I, I urge you all to think about your own use of substances in the past and the use of substances of friends or of family. Now think about how many of them carry convictions for doing that. We have disproportionate penalisation of certain communities in our country and they are the same communities who are disproportionately being penalised in all of the negative statistics. So this is inherently a racist drug law and it needs to be changed. So I think that if we are to talk about our restorative justice, we're to talk about justice at all, then we do need to be wiping those convictions of those with cannabis sole uh, convictions. Uh, but the other point, which is just a baseline common sense one, surely, so Bob McCroskey can get on board with this, is if people have served their time for something that was once illegal, they've served their time, they've done their due, whatever, whatever you think the purpose of the criminal justice system is, they've done their time, they then come out and they have a conviction. That thing then becomes legal. Why should they carry the burden of that conviction when they have already jumped through those hoops and served that time? It just makes no logical sense to me. So we'll move shortly to the Q&A. Um, so Paul, get, get ready. Um, <laughs> um, just as a final question, uh, I'd like to ask you both, uh, what would you say to anyone who's listening to this today and is maybe still on the fence about voting yes or no at the referendum? Well, what I'd say is uh, think of your children, mm -hmm. think of your grandchildren, uh, think uh, that actually 80% of them will use it at some point. Do they want to be... Uh, among those uh, who the police apprehend and decide to uh, arrest, uh, prosecute and convict. Mm. No one wants that for their family. For using a substance, which I stress again, is significantly less harmful than legal drugs like uh, alcohol and tobacco. Mm. So I say face the reality. This is in our community. A huge proportion of people have uh, used or, or will use it. Uh, we need to get some rules around it mm. so we can deal with the issue in an honest way. We're not dealing with it in an honest way at, at, at the moment. And in an honest way, we can then start talking about what, what the real issues are, why mm. it, it is actually a little bit dopey to use it, to coin a phrase. Um, so that, that would be, be my advice. Yeah. Mm. Um, we've been having this debate since well before I was born. Um, Helen was saying this stuff the year that I was born. We cannot keep going around in circles, wasting time, locking people up, wasting resources, uh, when we have the opportunity to not just save those resources and invest them in better things, but actually get better health outcomes, mental and physical, for our communities around this country. Even those kids who aren't um, settled with drug convictions, if they are using too young, then there is a problem. And there is, it is really difficult to intervene in that use because they are likely to hide it because it is illegal and they don't know where to go for help. They don't have any education on how to reduce that harm. So, you know, I ask rooms frequently, and this um, goes from, you know, grey powers to high schools and universities. Who here thinks that it makes sense to criminalise people who are using substances? OK, well, if we accept that as the premise, who here thinks that it makes sense to have gangs in control of those illicit substances? There's your answer. The answer is that this is common sense. We have well over 40 years of evidence and we just need to do the right thing. So I would implore all of you to speak to politicians uh, and just to, like, your local politician, whomever. We need a greater diversity of voices on this issue. I worry that it's being pigeonholed and painted as a fringe issue. But as we know, a huge amount of New Zealanders, over 80% of us, have consumed this by the time we're 21, and 11% of New Zealanders are using it on an annual basis. We can do so much better for all of those people. We can ensure that they have wraparound uh, health services, uh, and we can stop locking some people up. Well, thank you both very much. So uh, if you have a question, could you just raise your hand, please? And yeah, I've got a good, good number. Um, OK, we'll start with uh, this guy down the back. Uh, <laughs> Uh, hi. Hello. 
Yes. Um, so as part of the changes, I th um, one thing I was um, wondering about is that there's not really, because it's been an illegal substance, there's not been any really many long-term studies about the effects that it has on people's health, um, say towards tobacco and alcohol, which obviously have been legal and therefore they've been able to run studies. So is that something else that should be as part of this change is that we should look at the long-term health effects that it can have um, once it becomes legalised, so then you, there can be greater education for people using it. Yes, and, and that will become much easier to do when it is legal, because actually the illegality has caused issues with yep. with getting the evidence mm -hmm. and even the material for proper mm -hmm. uh, for proper studies. That's a report that mm -hmm. a point that our report labours uh, uh, quite a lot. So so definitely uh, more research. Mm -hmm. I'd also say to people, be you know very sceptical of the scare headlines that, mm. that you see. Uh, for example, in the teen area, uh, you know, yes, a lot of studies have shown that uh, there is a correlation uh, between uh, schizophrenia and, and cannabis, but there'll be a correlation with many things. What is far from proven is that there's any causality whatsoever. It may be that the predisposition to, to mental illness was what mm. led people down a, mm. a, a, a path to, to consumption. So just avoid the, the, the headlines mm. that are trying to grasp at anything mm. to make the case against it and mm. stand back and say, actually, mm. most people who use this know their hair doesn't fall out, their teeth don't go mm. green, you know, mm. they've gone on to lead <laughs> normal and productive uh, lives, mm. etc. Et the scare tactics uh, need to be dismissed, I think. Yeah, and on that point as well, mm. all of us anecdotally have examples of people who have probably used cannabis and had bad outcomes. We all probably have examples of that. Uh, all of that stuff's happened under prohibition, under the status quo. Why would we not uh, introduce an opportunity to get a sense of control over that situation? Um, but further to Helen's point around correlation not implies in, implying causation, uh, is that all of that stuff around the fact that people using young isn't good for them, we know that. That's why we want to legally regulate Put an uh, age on it. Exactly, put an age on it. Drug dealers don't check ID. Um, but the other thing is on the correlation point, uh, that so many of these people, and this is coming out a lot when it comes to um, substance abuse and dependency, it's self-medication. Mm. So they can spur and drive further mental health issues, but oftentimes they're people looking to fill a numbness. Uh, on the point of long-term health effects and studies therein, um, there are the seeds of that with Canada. Um, when Canada uh, legally regulated about a year ago now, uh, they made sure, they have a massive cannabis agency, um, which has hundreds of people employed, and they made sure that research and longitudinal research was baked in from the beginning, and we're intending to do the same. Um, but, you know, in terms of the war on drugs and how that has stifled research, this is apparent in so many different areas, particularly on the issue of medicinal cannabis. I find it really perverse that we have a situation where we're quite happy to trust uh, things that are cooked up in labs, um, but a natural plant, because we've persecuted it for 40 years, uh, we're, we're, just, we're not willing to really engage with that uh, discussion and to bring that into the mould. And it's really, really interesting that we have on the one side of things with pharmaceuticals, uh, commercial entities who can jump through all of these hoops, pass all of these tests, able to get them into a pharmaceutical model. What we have with medicinal cannabis is people throwing away cocktails of pharmaceutical drugs that come with massive side effects that are hugely detrimental to their lives, uh, who have been advocating through grassroots approaches, green theories, regular average people who are risking going to jail in order to help their friends and their whanau now trying to fit this into a hyper-commercialised pharmaceutical model. I mean, to me, that shows that actually the approach that we've been taking for a long time probably doesn't work very well. Mm. Yeah. Just from the perspective of writing this report as well, trying to get good data at the moment on <laughs> cannabis is really difficult, um, both on users and the actual substance. Mm -hmm. You know, but both of those things are very difficult to access if you're a researcher. Uh, and uh, you know, to, if you wanted to actually test the substance itself, you're looking at months and ethics mm -hmm. committees and paperwork. So, you, yeah, so many people just don't bother. Uh, 
and mm. that will all become a lot easier in a legal mm. market situation. Got a hand in the middle here. Hand in the middle here. <laughs> Gender balance. Yeah, yeah, got to balance that. Out. <laughs> Thank you. We've talked a lot about harm reduction, uh, which is really important. I'm also interested in both your opinions on the economic development potential if we change the legislation. I mean, here's potentially an exciting new industry for New Zealand. It's something that I think we're good at. We've got the right climate. We've got huge areas of unemployment, people potentially with these skills. Mm. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on this, both recreationally and as a, a medical industry? And, and obviously quite a lot of experience of growing it as well. That, that, <laughs> that's what I mean, underutilisation. So yes, yeah. you, you can create a, a legal market here and that legal market mm. uh, would be uh, both for the supply of the medicinal mm. uh, products uh, but also for the, uh, the personal uh, use and, mm. and, and consumption. Mm. Uh, actually, one of the issues that's debated in some jurisdictions is, you know, should those with a conviction for mm. supply in the past be able to enter the market? And as a Global Commission on Drug Policy, we say, yes, mm. why would you exclude those folk uh, when the market becomes a, a legal one? Mm. So yes, I think it does, it does have potential. Mm. We've got a record of growing it. Uh, mm. We can grow many things in New Zealand, why, why not this? Mm. Yeah, and um, further to, to those points, uh, the thing about um, people who have convictions, people arguing that they shouldn't be allowed to enter a legally regulated market, what do you want them to do except yeah. commit more crime? <laughs> like, seriously, what option are you providing them if they have to continue to be saddled with that conviction and they can't do what they obviously do well? Mm. Um, uh, so on the point around the opportunity for economic development, this is where I think it's really important uh, that we don't drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, whilst there is a massive opportunity, particularly for restoring justice in those areas that have been economically deprived and actually disproportionately impacted under criminalisation, the likes of Northland and the East Coast, uh, I don't want that to be rationale for us jumping down a hyper-commercialised model because that only sees the increase in harm and it also will open the door to big money starting to smell that there's an opportunity here and completely astroturfing over those smaller providers. Um, there is already examples of this, for example, in Luatoria, um, EIT, the Polytech there, um, which I visited, uh, Manu Kadi, uh, who runs Hikarangi Enterprises on the East Coast, has been collaborating, um, and Panapa as well, with that EIT to provide a hemp growing course. Uh, in a time when we have politics struggling to survive, it is one of the most oversubscribed <laughs> politic courses in the country. Uh, but it's, So it's got about 500 people on the waiting list. It only takes about 40. Uh, and the people who they are privileging into that course are those who do have historical convictions, are those who are from the local community and are those who will stay in that community and help rebuild it. So that's the kind of stuff that we need to be looking at. Um, and I was having um, actually a, a really lively debate with this awesome um, woman from Mexico when I was in uh, Vienna at the UN Commission uh, about how what we have um, and the opportunity to create a sensible legally regulated market for cannabis uh, is not just the opportunity to do stuff way better than we did it with food regulation or alcohol or tobacco regulation, but it's actually the opportunity to showcase a different kind of economy in general, uh, one that actually reinvests in people, uh, one that doesn't just pride itself on growth at all costs, but one that serves the well-being of the communities that, under prohibition, it harmed. Okay, right. another question? Down the back. Down the back. Um, just wait till, so could you just wait till the mic gets to you? Thank you. Uh, how do we prevent big cam uh, cannabis dominating the market and make it possible for general citizens to enter this market? I, I think basically Chloe's just spoken to that at, at, at some length. And I think if you opt against a heavily commercial model, mm. that also contributes uh, to that. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the big, big commerce gets less interested if something is heavily regulated, mm. can't be promoted, can't go and sponsor the local sports team, mm. uh, this kind of thing. So I think, you know, the, the way that New Zealand regulates uh, can, if you like, end up giving preference to the, mm. the local supply. Yeah, yeah. there's massive opportunity to do that um, and it's basically just uh, how we end up regulating. Um, what I'm wary of is those who are presently in opposition switching tack as soon as they start to smell the money. 
Um, and I have noticed this occurring at, uh, I've only recently in the past two years become engaged in this topic, but subsequent to that, um, I've been at a number of different forums talking about cannabis law reform, and the rooms have changed mm. in terms of the demographics who are coming to them. Mm. There are suits now. Mm. And that's the kind of thing that I want to be careful with. You know, not to say that suits inherently are demonstrative of any kind of features of people or whatever. But, um, uh, yeah, what I'm saying is that in order to make sure that we are uh, providing preferential treatment, particularly to those communities who have been disp disproportionately harmed under prohibition, um, we just have to get the regs right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Any more questions? A couple over here, uh, yeah. Paul. Uh, <laughs> gender balance uh, to that table. <laughs> 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 Um, hi. Um, I think it's a fair assumption to say that most people in the room and also watching today um, would take a common sense approach to voting yes. On the way in, I saw a billboard outside Central Police Station that says, say no to dope. So, um, <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Yes. Yeah. So what would your advice be to us as individuals in terms of how do we take this common sense evidence-based fact, not fiction, out to the voting public to give them an informed ability to make to make the right vote? I think it's uh, everyone using the networks that they have. You know, we, we all have families, we, we meet, we have friends, we have associations. Uh, many, many of us are connected through our social media. If everyone who, you know, was found the arguments here today uh, compelling went away and put up in their Facebook post. I just went to a really interesting conversation with Helen and Chloe and, mm. you know, I'll, I'll be voting yes and here's why and do a link to the report. I just think it's got to percolate out around that because yeah. you do have some very noisy people mm. with access to a microphone uh, mm. who are at it day in, uh, day out. Mm. And I think it, it's got to be a grassroots, literally, mm. movement that, mm. uh, that, that takes that on. I, I do believe the New Zealand Drug Foundation will um, yep. play a very important part in leading a, a responsible uh, campaign. And by the way, next Monday night they have a rally in the town hall, They're which is, is being <laughs> flyers on your table uh, uh, about it. And I'll be there, and I'm sure Chloe, <laughs> Chloe will be there. There'll be people from offshore mm -hmm. who come to, uh, to support this as well. Uh, and then, of course, people have to vote, right? Mm -hmm. People have to vote, and I think the message has to go out to, to young and old. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if you want common sense to happen in mm -hmm. the law around cannabis, mm -hmm. please enroll and vote. Yeah. Yeah. This is just a, it's maybe slightly glib, but the, I've seen the Say No to Dope campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's all over social media, it's online. But it, it seems so American to me. I, I, as a New Zealander, I've never heard anyone call it dope. Yeah. It sounds like an American yeah. in a film. No, but you know? it, it actually <laughs> is. <laughs> yeah. um, and the the language of that campaign and the examples they use seem to me very distant from what we're actually dealing with. Mm. Yeah. But there, um, I mean, that, that campaign comes from Family First and they're heavily associated to, um, I forgot the name of the organisation um, in the States. Uh, so media here. Uh, if you guys want to look into where Bob McCroskey gets his money, I think that his money, I think that's a worthy cause. Um, but the stuff that I was going to say around um, how we actually convince um, and how we make it percolate out, um, Helen, for example, does a really good job of replying to everybody on Twitter. I'm not sure how you do that. Um, she's got magical powers. It takes some patience and tolerance, <laughs> um, uh, And amazing use of emojis. Um, but the, uh, basically what we have to realise, right, is I think that... There is a shared understanding across New Zealand that even those who are in the prohibition camp, the same basic first principles apply as to our camp, which is that we want to keep kids safe and we want to increase community wellbeing. That is the baseline of the conversation that we have to be having. If we accept that's the premise, then the conversation has to be, okay, we agree on this. How do we achieve that? Because this has failed. You know, um, so to me, I think it's all those basics that we teach kids in kindergarten about how to have political conversations. Um, we presume that conversations about politics or political issues are going to escalate to fisticuffs. They don't have to. Um, if we just actually hear out people's concerns, uh, I would actually say that while social media is really good for sharing this stuff, if you're going to have a debate which could be quite heated uh, with somebody who disagrees, try and take it offline. 
um, and have these conversations around the family dinner table in a way that accepts people's fears and concerns, but helps to channel them into where the evidence actually is so that they can get the outcomes that they share with you. They want those same outcomes. So we just have to, you know, you can lead the horse to water, um, but you have to do that quite carefully. And the other one um, is around media. So media obviously has a role to play, um, but the other side is the social media that we all have access to. Um, and I think that we need to get a lot better at sharing the facts on this stuff. The problem is, as Helen originally premised, all this stuff seems so counterintuitive to begin with because we're like, we want less people to be, um, you know, uh, have harm um, come about as a result of using this stuff. So most people go, oh, just ban it. The thing is, you can't ban it. We've been trying to ban it for 40 years. Uh, so we need to come up with quite simplistic ways to explain this stuff to people because it's a lot more complex than, say, nope to dope. Um, but there are a number of NGOs um, that have been raised, like um, the Drug Foundation, Health Not Handcuffs, Just Speak, Tanya's over there, uh, who will all be doing um, graphics and facts that you can share with people to hopefully make this stuff or help it sink in. Yeah. So last question. Um, please make it punchy. Um, uh, cool. Okay, in the middle there. Simon. Simon. How do we deal with our secondary schools who are kicking kids out for dope and who are purporting to be experts on young people and speaking really strongly against um, the change? Mm. Mm. Do I don't, I, I mean, speaking to the PPTA, I don't think that they, do they currently have a strong position against it? Well, that wasn't my understanding. The management of secondary yeah, the management of certain secondary schools who've probably been quite vocal so far. Um, I know, you know, what we know, um, and this is from national evidence, but also internationally, is that kicking kids out of school is basically a pathway to prison um, or to really negative um, life outcomes. And also it is absolutely the case that the kind of uh, intervening factors that are able to be wrapped around kids who are expelled from school are really similar to the kinds of aggravating and mitigating factors in sentencing. Um, so certain elements of privilege, that being having family support, having access to resources, all those things that poorer kids don't have, uh, are counted against them. <laughs> um, so uh, for me, uh, we're actually currently looking at, and this is with my education portfolio hat on, we're currently looking at a lot of change in that area. Um, I've long been a, an advocate for what youth law um, have advocated for, which is to uh, a allow for an appeals process and that proper mediation to ensure that kids actually stay in school. Mm. Uh, because, yeah, basically that's the approach that we kind of have to be taking to it. Right now, there's not the same approach taken to kids who, um, you know, drink alcohol on the weekends. Um, so I think that we kind of have to have uh, some sense of balance in the debate and some sense of rationality. What I would say is that legal regulation will provide us the opportunity to have these conversations meaningfully as a country, whereas right now it's happening on a very ad hoc basis. Mm. Yeah, I, look, bottom line is no school should accept tobacco, alcohol, yep. cannabis or anything else on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but if a, if a young person is apprehended uh, out of school for it, well, obviously what we are advocating is that this not be prosecuted at all. Uh, the government proposal is for an age limit of, of 20, which yep. will need to be enforced, but that doesn't mean the under 20 should be prosecuted, right? You've got the Misuse of Drug Act amendment already there that says that people should not be arrested and prosecuted, they should be diverted. And, and a young person can be, you know, diverted into a, a counselling service about why, you know, you, you shouldn't be, you know, having cannabis at that, mm. at, at that particular age. But I totally agree with, with Chloe that some schools are far too quick to throw young people out mm. and that blights those young people's future. Mm. And every possible effort should be made to keep young people in school mm. and not push them out. Mm. Mm. I would also say this as a um, high school mm. dropout. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Great. Well, uh, thank you both so much for coming and participating today and thank you all so much for coming and watching. Um, like we mentioned before, there are some more events coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the rally on the 16th of September, uh, which has uh, Helen Clark will be speaking in again, uh, but also a range of fascinating uh, both local and international experts, including leaders from the Black Lives Matter movement. So uh, by all means, go along to that. There's some flyers on your table uh, and uh, please share our report and tweet about it on social media and thank Thank you all so much.